hi everybody and a very warm welcome to another video. I'm Diane Danzibrink, therapist and founder of Menopause Support and the National Make Menopause Matter campaign. And I am absolutely delighted to have not just two friends here today, but also the co-authors of the wonderful, the complete guide to POI and early menopause. Dr. Hannah Short and Dr. Mandy Leonhart. Thank you both very much for taking the time to speak to me today. Oh, yeah, pleasure, thank you for asking us. <laughs> you are very welcome. Um, so can I ask you both, um, maybe Hannah first, to introduce yourselves, tell everybody who you are and what you do. <laughs> So I'm Hannah and I trained as a GP, but I now work exclusively in women's health and primarily um, as a menopause specialist. I've done extra training in that area and also premenstrual disorders. Um, and I've also got a personal history of surgical menopause in my 30s. So I kind of I suppose that's where part of my passion comes from. And Mandy? I um, have a similar background uh, to Hannah. So I'm a GP as well and uh, now work. Uh, mainly in, in menopause, um, but also as a sessional GP, but mainly in, in women's health and menopause care. Um, I've got a bit of um, training in nutrition as well. And um, yeah, so uh, yeah, women's health is, re is really my passion, lifestyle medicine and women's health and hormonal disorders. Fabulous. Thank you both. And so these two amazing women have written this fabulous book, for which my own review began bloody marvellous. <laughs> and that's because it's exactly what it is. Um, the review went on to say an outstanding piece of work, clearly written with great care and attention to detail, informative and insightful, a true labour of love. Brava, Hannah and Mandy, this will help so many. And I mean every single word of it. It is a bloody marvellous book and an amazing achievement. So before we talk about the detail that's in the book, can I ask you both, what was it that made you want to write this book? Um, well, I mean, firstly, thank you so much for your kind words and, and you know, for, for your endorsement, because it just is so, I don't know, so it means a lot, I think, to both of us that, that you know, people have responded really positively to it. Um, I mean, I'm, personally, I, I wanted to write the book because there was nothing like this when I went through an early surgical menopause at 35. And then I realised that if I struggled as a doctor, I don't know what everybody else was doing because I still found it hard to access information and support, even when I was under the care of a very good and compassionate gynaecologist. Um, and I, I just thought, you know, I, I'm now in a kind of privileged position, really, of helping other women and seeing what they go through. And I can, can I kind of distill that on my own experience and what I've, I've learned through my clinic and working with colleagues? Um, and, and if we can put it into a readable format and hopefully get it out there for other people to read, because sadly still, as we know, not everybody has access to good care. Um, and hopefully this kind of helps shine a light in the darkness for those people who are really struggling. So that was the main reason. Mandy, can I ask you, why did you choose to write this together? I did not choose, um, or I didn't set out to go, you know, to kind of write a book. It was like an organic um, thing that evolved over time after I got to know Hannah. Yep. So we, we met on Twitter, we became Twitter friends, and Hannah joined us and was um, a guest speaker um, at a menopause cafe that pre-COVID that we had organised. Um, so that's when we met in person and then we really connected in a sense that we wanted to learn, we knew that we didn't know everything, neither of us did, and we connected very much also by discussing cases we struggled with in our own clinic and we found that a lot of cases we ended up discussing were women with a more complex background, early menopause, surgical menopause, and we felt really desperate to, to help them because we saw them were suffering and so we, we discussed cases, um, we learned from each other, Hannah even set up a CPD group uh, inviting other doctors to join, but at the end of the day we realized that there is a group of women out there that are underserved currently in the menopause debate and that there isn't much literature for them out to reach out to read up on. 
um, particularly women who can't take HRT, for example, women after cancer treatment and so on. So um, we 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 then watched what happened with regards to menopause literature on the market, and we thought, hey, hang on a minute, there is nothing there for for, for women who are younger um, and and have different more complex conditions. And that's um, when we had this idea, and um, it evolved involved evolved from there. We it was just a sort of a spark. Uh, yeah moment and it was a bit serendipity that we both had this idea we were both on board we were both committed and it worked out in the end it wasn't always easy but it was fun and we we supported each other and it was a fantastic experience and we couldn't believe when it actually was a reality in the end and not just an idea so for all the negativity that there can be around social media that's just another reason why it can have real positives yeah. as well isn't yeah. it <laughs> And Hannah, can I ask you, what was the collaborative process like? Because collaboration on anything, whether it's a book, music, film, any kind of academic project, it's not always easy. So was this was this a first book for both of you? And if it was, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, I suppose it was a, a process that um, we well, it, it was all new to both of us. Neither of us had written a book before. And if we were used to writing anything, I suppose it was more in the academic space. And we realised that we wanted to, needed to write something slightly different and that was accessible to everybody. Um, and I think that that was obviously a, a bit of a challenge. But in terms of how we kind of went about writing the book um, between us, especially because we were separated completely during COVID. I mean, we're yes. not geographically close to each other, but when we thought about writing the book initially, we'd met in London pre-COVID and we'd jotted down a few ideas and we'd literally just started with a rough idea about what topics do we need to cover. Um, and we basically, we, we, I'd spoken to a friend who had written a book, um, a, you know, a similar type of book on a different healthcare issue. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I'll take her lead. And, and she said she'd, she'd written it with someone else as well. And I said, well, we just divide up the chapters. We'll put it out there and see how these things go um, and we'd actually started writing a couple of chapters and then was approached by a publisher who saw what we'd done liked it but they said actually can you just slightly change the tone or the you know things like that so we had to kind of go back to the drawing board and then we were actually given quite a tight deadline um, and, and literally we were just like well let's just start writing what we feel most strongly about what we're passionate about or what we feel drawn to and so we'd each write a chapter and then we'd share it with each other and then we'd make comments. Um, and essentially it was, it, it was just like that until we had a book and we were just wondering how does it all come together? But but somehow it, it did. Um, but I, I think it's because we did talk the whole way along. We shared stuff. If you weren't sure, we checked if if we weren't sure about particular statistics or a study or you know some you know some of we all we have different knowledge areas even though you know we cover the same thing some of us yeah. have you know one of us will know more in one area than the other so um yeah we just we just talked a lot so Mandy is pretty sick of me because she <laughs> probably spoke most days at one point <laughs> so uh, so Mandy yeah. how long was how long was the process well, we had our deadline was um, we started in all seriousness from October last year, and the deadline was thirty first of um, December. So we had three months to three do months. Yeah, and and that was in addition to our clinical work. So and having a life. Oh <laughs> my house. house. You 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 can't <laughs> have had a life, life as well. <laughs> Well, yes, and it, Hannah, it you was, had a house move, didn't you? Yeah, and, and Hannah moved house at the same time. But I think um, it was it required a lot of commitment. But we both, even though it, it was a lot of pressure, we both wanted it finished. And actually, having a deadline made it easier. If we had given an open end um, a submission date, yeah, then it would have probably we would have been a bit more procrastinating, a bit more relaxed. And and that way, we had it didn't have to be a perfect manuscript. It just had to be a raw manuscript um, that we can work on and, and it was in the end we have to move move away from being perfectionists we both are perfectionists in in, in different ways um yeah. Hannah is amazing at spelling and uh commas and i'm <laughs> so, uh, so she's got a great eye for detail and often i, I, I was a pain my, my painful micromanager i think but. <laughs> no, no no but but we had to move slightly away from being a uh, perfectionist to deliver the perfect a manuscript it wasn't what they were after and um, there was a lot of after work so once we submitted there was more work to do and yeah we, we understand that process now but at the, when we set out to write a book we wanted it to be perfect from the outset which which wasn't actually necessary but I think um 
doing it. We, we did it as well as we could in the end. And it was a bit, all a bit serendipity and, and it was a real relief submitting it. Um, and, and then you, you actually creating something that, that someone else reads and likes is, is, a, is, a, is a great pleasure. It's, a, it's also, we had a lot of anxiety about what, you know, because you're sharing parts of yourself in a sense, you, not, it wasn't uh, biographical or anything. Um, well, for Hannah, she included a lot of her own experience, but, um, but it was, you're, you're open to criticism. And um, as an author, it's, it's never just, you know, putting it out there and see how it goes. It is your project. It's your, your effort, your energy that you invested and you, you want it to be liked. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Resonate. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so there is no way that we are going to be able to cover the content of this book in just under 40 minutes. <laughs> but before we, um, you know, sort of, so just for people who are tuning in, this is really just to give you a feel of what is in the book um, and to give you an overview of some of the topics that are covered. So the title is The Complete Guide to POI and Early Menopause. So Hannah, can I ask you, we, we use terms around early and premature menopause. So for instance, premature, early, POI, mm -hmm. premature ovarian insufficiency. Would you be kind enough to explain A, what those things are, and B, what are the differences and or similarities between those terms? Because I think it can be really confusing for people. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and we've done a little table in the book kind of explaining the different terms because I think it is confusing for patients, particularly when clinicians just use interchangeable terms. And I, I probably do that myself, but I, you can sometimes forget yourself. Um, and also the terms have changed over the years. So. Just quickly, natural menopause is said to occur at around the age of 51, and that's when you're a year after your final menstrual period. But any age after 45 is considered within, you know, the natural normal kind of time frame. You have an early menopause if your period stop below the age of 45, and a premature menopause below if, if your period stop below the age of, of 40. But if you if this happens below the age of 40, um, it, the preferred term now is premature ovarian insufficiency or POI, which has previously been referred to as premature ovarian failure or primary ovarian insufficiency. So you hear all of these things banded around as well. And I think it's groups of you know, international experts have collaborated and said POI should be the preferred term. The problem is POI is not exactly the same, if we're being strict about it, as, as early menopause, because menopause is quite finite. So, you know, it, it's, it's permanent. So if you've gone through menopause, there will be no more periods. Whereas if you actually have a true diagnosis of premature ovarian insufficiency, um, there may be fluctuations in ovarian activity. So um, we can go into more detail about what all of this is, but um, essentially, you may be having periods, but they may be very, very few and far between, um, and there's still a reduced ovarian activity. Um, and I think some people don't like the term POI, for example, like in my case, I had um, my ovaries removed at 35, so I fall into the POI category, but obviously I don't have any ovaries to be insufficient. Um, but yeah, oh, I you were in surgical, surgical POI, um, although I tend to say, well, it's surgical, premature surgical menopause. Um, but it's, it, yeah, I wonder if I think it's just trying to classify groups of people who've experienced things at different times. I think the similarities are that there's an issue in terms of, well, they share some of similar symptoms in terms of irregular and stopping periods and the, um, the physical symptoms of estrogen deficiency and the long-term health risks. Um, so that's why we, in the end, we brought it all together because I know you can sometimes see debates on social media. People say, I don't have POI, I have surgical menopause, um, you know, or vice versa. And POI isn't the same as menopause. And for some people, it's really important you distinguish it. And we do recognize that. Um, but we thought that a lot of people, whether they have a diagnosis of POI or early menopause and have the same issues and um, psychological, physical, everything else that's going on. So that's why we, we thought it, 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 was, it was OK to bring it all together. But we haven't even talked about medical menopause and, you know, medical menopause is menopause that's induced, you know, as a result of medical and surgical treatments. But we'll come on to the causes, I guess, in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will. Mandy, over to you. <laughs> So would you talk through some of those causes? 
Yeah, so um, we have to go all the way back to puberty. Um, and it's because this, these conditions span such a wide age range from pretty much girl uh, starting puberty up to the age of 45, we have to start at puberty. So there will be some girls who never uh, develop um, ovarian function, who, who start off with not having ovarian function, not going through puberty, not making estrogen and, and sex um, hormones. Um, so that may be due to a genetic um, problem, Turner syndrome, fragile X. So there are genetic problems, girls who never have a, a period. And, and then if we go on with regards to age, then there are uh, women who may have started off with a normal puberty and then um, stop having periods in their mid-20s or any any time after puberty. And, and then there are other reasons for those. Um, and they can, there's a multitude of reasons. There could be autoimmune conditions. Um, there, there can be... Um, metabolic conditions. Um, a lot of um, causes for PI, there's an overlap of autoimmune conditions where we never really know has the autoimmune condition caused the PI or the other way around, but there is a 40%, roughly a 40% um, overlap of, of women who have, so 40% of women with PI also have an autoimmune condition, but the majority of, of those affected, we don't really know. We never find a, a cause. Um, we usually look much harder in, in younger girls and, and, and younger women um, to find a cause but um, and sometimes we do find a genetic cause or some an autoimmune problem or um, but um, often women don't we don't find a cause there, there are chemicals in the environment um, sometimes we, we know why why it happens because they had cancer treatment or um, it was simply by choice you know surgical menopause or, or it was because they had treatment for severe uh, premenstrual dis disorders like PMDD and they went into chemical menopause and, and they knew this would happen. Um, yes, there is a multitude of, of different causes and I um, we have discussed them in the book. It's, it's very difficult to, to mention them all without yes. to detail, but um, it is important that we, I think uh, periods are a vital sign really and it's important that, that those who used to have peers or never have peers, it, it, it needs to be investigated. We can talk about it in a minute about diagnosis. Um, Perfect, thank the you. Line is really the majority uh, of, of those affected, we, we, the majority do not know why they are affected, sadly. Yeah, and as Mandy said, those, those causes are covered in depth in the book. So there is a lot of information there in the book about those. Um, so Hannah, Mandy mentioned, you know, sort of about periods there. Could we talk about some of the potential symptoms, mm -hmm. particularly for perhaps younger individuals who, of course, may never have come across the term menopause or perimenopause? Um, can we talk about some of the symptoms that can be experienced? Well, the first thing, I mean, Mandy's talking about periods being a vital sign. So if you've had normally, reg, you know, regular periods um, and um, suddenly they become irregular, this needs to be investigated. And, you know, or if your periods stop, um, especially if this goes on for longer than four months, then we really need to kind of look into that. I mean, there can be a number of causes. It doesn't automatically assume that you're somebody's entering POI or an, an early menopause. Um, and is that so we shouldn't jump to any conclusions. There's all kinds of other, other conditions like polycystic ovarian syndrome or dramatic weight loss or other conditions that can kind of, that can lead to changes in the periods. But that that would be one of the, the main signs we'd look for. Um, but the, the symptoms can be quite similar to those experienced in natural menopause, um, or, you know, which would be experienced maybe later in a woman's life. So things like hot flushes, um, you know, feelings of extreme heat that often seem to well up from the center mm -hmm. of the body, um, the psychological changes, so feeling a little bit more irritable, you know, having mood swings, crying outbursts, feeling quite anxious, insomnia is quite a common one, muscle pain, headaches, worsening migraines, um, vaginal dryness, recurrent urinary tract infections, there's a whole host of symptoms. Um, and they're, they're all related to changing levels of oestrogen and, and ultimately falling levels of oestrogen. Um, and because this has sets off kind of like an inflammatory process in the body, and which is why you get the whole array of symptoms. It affects every part of the body and brain. So Mandy, could you talk to us a little bit about um, diagnosis for somebody who is in um, premature ovarian insufficiency or 
premature menopause, whatever term people are using. Could you talk about how potentially that is correctly diagnosed? Yeah, so if, um, like, let's go back again to the very young age groups. So if you are a girl, you're 15, and you have not started your period, and you have not started to develop sexually, so with regards to breast growth and pubic hair and um, so on, you should really see a doctor and be referred. Um, and for those, they need really specialist, probably multidisciplinary input from a pediatric gynecologist and, and endocrinologist. They need genetic testing and so on. Um, let's say you've, you're you in your mid-20s and you've, as Hannah said, you haven't had a period for four months mm -hmm. and you have, you may or may not have menopause symptoms alongside it. Again, you see your GP. The GP can run some basic tests and while you're being referred to secondary care, ideally, ideally a gynecologist with an interest in, in this condition. So what we are testing is um, something called FSH, which we do not do in over 45 year olds and we bang on about it. We don't <laughs> FSH, thank you very much. But in that age group, really important. Follicle stimulating hormone, really important in that age group. In, in, in someone who hasn't had a period for, for more than four months, because if it's really high, Yes, it could be as uh, it could be indicative of POI, um, because as Hannah said, we need to exclude other conditions. We also want to check estradiol levels. We want to check a baseline um, other conditions, um, doing just a general um, baseline blood test, and um, and we need to, we would do testosterone as well, um, checking kidneys, liver, and we would do an ultrasound scan of the of the ovaries as well. Um, some some specialists may do other specialist testing, like the anti-malarian hormone, which isn't a, a diagnostic tool, but it could be indicative of the ovarian egg count mm -hmm. if you're thinking about um, fertility. So there will be other tests, but the tests uh, that we do, there are some baseline tests that everyone should have, and then they become more and more individualized, where you have to, if, if you have confirmed PUI with a, with a high FSH and LH as well, you test L, uh, luteal hormone as well. Um, then you, you take it from there and then you investigate further and sort of narrow it down, trying to find a cause, maybe doing autoimmune screens, fragile, testing for fragile eggs, doing some gen genetic testing uh, until you exhaust all those tests and either you found a cause or you haven't, but you, you could then have a diagnosis at least. That initial blood test that you talked about, Mandy, is that a one-off blood test or should that be run more than once? No, good po point. You would do uh, you would do it um, about four to six weeks apart. You, you need two raised FSH levels. Okay. Uh, there are, yeah, so there might be, a, if there might be other tests, you know, you may, may need a brain scan, for example, if you, you would check things like pro prolactin, uh, which is um, something that a brain tumor sometimes produces, mm -hmm. so suppress uh, levels of FSH. Um, is that, that can suppress uh, um, ovarian function. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so there are. It is quite a specialist territory um, where, but GPs can usually start some of the the, the field, the, the baseline work um, until you see a specialist. And it's important that you keep tracking your periods um, while while they do that. And then once you have had your diagnosis, what is really essential as well that you have a baseline bone scan, uh, bone density scan um, at baseline, so that any treatment you might go on. To uh, will you will monitor your bone density and make sure that whatever treatment you receive is effective for your bone health. You should also be seen by ideally by a cardiologist. Uh, you, you should be seen annually at least um, by um, within a multidisciplinary team. Ideally, because not having sex hormones, including estrogen, really affects your entire body, and um, you could develop long term health problems if you do are not if you're not on the appropriate treatment. Perfect. Hannah, would you be kind enough to expand a little bit on what Mandy was just touching on there with sort of the potential long term effects if you do have that diagnosis of premature menopause POI? Yeah. So one of the reasons that we're really keen to kind of um, pick up and diagnose girls and women with this condition is because there, it's not just about the symptoms um, that, that they may be struggling with, which can have a huge impact on their quality of life, of course, but it's, it's also the long term health effects. So we know that women who go through a natural menopause in their 50s, for example, they're already at increased risk um, after that point of, of having, you know, um, less or weaker bones and, you know, increased risk of osteoporosis, heart disease. And 
and so on. Um, unfortunately, that, that risk is, comes much earlier for women with POI and, and early menopause. And so you're, you're likely to have kind of a lower bone density, which is, is a, again, a much greater risk of, um, of osteoporosis, which can lead to frailty and disability later in life. Um, and it, and it's, the problem is with osteoporosis, it's kind of a silent disease. You don't really know you have it until it causes complications, like you might fracture more easily. Um, and once you've had one fracture, there's a 50% chance of having another fracture. Right. Um, and I'm not saying this to scare people, but it's just so they know that, that it's important. It's, it's not just about managing symptoms, because some, some girls, as particularly some of the younger girls, may not actually have a lot of the traditional menopausal symptoms, especially if they haven't had periods for a number of years. Maybe they've right. never, never had a period or because their body's not used to higher levels of estradiol. Mm -hmm. But um, so particularly the younger girls, they, it's important to, that, that they're, they're on kind of hormone replacement therapy if they're able to take it. Because the good news is that you can reduce the risk of, of osteoporosis if you do take replacement estrogen. And as Mandy mentioned about the heart, there's an increased risk of heart disease because um, yeah, estrogen is beneficial for the heart. Um, and there's also increased risk, unfortunately, of things like Parkinson's and dementia if we if we don't replace the estrogen as well. I mean, there are other things we can do. So obviously don't want to alarm people if they can't take it. Yeah. Um, but it's just, in a, yeah, there, there are a number of things that are very important that may not be immediately obvious. Um, and obviously there's a huge impact on fertility or loss of fertility. Yes. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Okay. So um, Mandy, Hannah's mentioned HRT, hormone replacement therapy. Um, could you talk a little bit about treatment options for somebody who has had a diagnosis or perhaps somebody who has had a diagnosis but actually doesn't know about all the potential treatment options could you give an overview and again I would say within this chat we're not going to have time to cover everything in detail but again there is great information in the book all about this yeah so um let's say you've received your diagnosis um and basically the ovaries um, are a gland that produce what we call sex steroid hormones. Um, so this is estrogen, to, to keep it estrogen, progesterone and, and testosterone. The most important one is, um, is estrogen for what Hannah already mentioned, bone health, heart health, brain health, muscle health um, and general development as well. So when we, um, when, when we have diagnosed um, someone and they, can, they have no contraindications for, for HRT, so this is not because they've had um, hormone positive breast cancer or something so then hrt would be the first line treatment because essentially we're just replacing the hormones the ovaries would make naturally yeah. with the same molecules which we are now calling body identical hrt it's, but we have this option now we um, can use it predominantly through the skin uh, preferably transdermal but that doesn't mean they can't take oral estrogen either because if they don't absorb it we the, the base, the bottom line is we want to get that estrogen into their body. And we, we need to find a way to do this. And they would try transdermal options if that doesn't work. They can try oral options or even implants. Um, and we would closely monitor that they actually do not achieve symptom control, but that we actually achieve a level in their bloodstream. So while in naturally menopausal women who are on HRT, who feel well, on the HRT, whatever they are on, on a, on a licensed, um, reasonable dose, we wouldn't necessarily do blood tests in them because, you know, it's, it's the symptom control we are after. But in younger women, uh, we need to um, sort of try and achieve, we try and achieve a blood level in the system that is, provides enough bone protection. Sometimes we, we have to look at the patient and how well they are. Sometimes we, do, we cannot just go up and up and up. Sometimes we need to consider how, how they're feeling on whatever HRT they're on and their well-being is paramount. So it's, it's and then the blood level comes second. Um, it is really important. So it's estradiol we replace, um, but also in women, in particular in women with, with surgical menopause and, and in POI, we need to also look at testosterone. It gives them, it really is essential for, for their well-being, um, not just libido, but general but, um, energy levels and, and then cognitive thinking. Um, because particularly in women with surgical menopause, they would have they would have lost about half of their total to, to testosterone, which might affect them. And and even enough uh, may not be enough. So, um, but then looking at the younger cohort as well, we, we need to give women options, and girls options, and some younger girls may prefer to go on the contraceptive pill yeah. because let's say you're 19 and oh, and and you have you don't get periods and 
all your friends have periods and all your friends are on the pill, you want to be like them. And the pill is another option. It may not be as preferred in terms of the hormones that are, con are that um, are part of the pill, but right. at the, end, the pill is another option if it is important for the individual to have periods, for example. So there may be a time in their life when they wish to have a period and the pill will give them a withdrawal bleed, which is an artificially induced bleed. You know, and you have to discuss that with them. You have to say, how important is it for you to have a period? And at the end of the day, we also have to consider that there is a very, very small chance that they are, that, that they may conceive and, and that they might become pregnant, even though we don't want to increase their hopes to a level where, where it's unrealistic. But we need to also counsel women about contraception. So some in some very young girls, the contraceptive pill may actually be a really good option. Um, yeah. um, so these are the options. And we, we talk them through this. It's all about getting the hormones into their system, getting it up to a level where they feel well, where they function, where they have enough bone protection. And, um, and it is down to the individual's choice. Uh, what is what, Where are the priorities with regard to their health and their symptoms and long-term prevention of problems? And for those, Mandy, where, so obviously for those women um, who still have their womb, they would need progesterone too. Correct, yes. And for, um, for, for those individuals who, for one medical reason or another, would not have HRT as first line, there are other things that can be considered as well, aren't there? It's not as if there's, it's not as if there's no options for them. There are other options that you can help them with too. Yeah, so there. Are, um, so if you cannot have HRT, you you there is medication for symptom control. So uh, there is there. Are, um, if you have hot flushes, you can you can try types of antidepressants, SSRIs, that can help control the hot flushes. There are options for sleep. Um, there's, there's amitriptyline. There are is gabapentin. There's certain herbs, herbal options you might have. Melatonin um, supplements. Um, I think if you can't take HRT, it is really, really important that you also pay a lot of attention to your lifestyle because you, you haven't got the protection from the estrogen that your body normally would have. So you need to make sure that you contribute through your lifestyle to a positive, to your heart health and to your brain health and to put, pay attention to, to the food you eat and, and exercise and, and avoid things smoke, like smoking and alcohol that could be detrimental and put an extra burden on, on your organs, on your, on your heart and on your brain. So uh, everyone needs to pay attention to their lifestyle, but <laughs> estrogen, it's even more important. So Hannah, that was a perfect segue, thank you Mandy, into my next question for you, which is what would be your top lifestyle tips? And I, I'm, I'm really focusing here on those individuals who are in this early or premature menopause, but actually I think much of this information applies to everybody, doesn't it? So, yeah. you know, kind of what would be your top tips? Well, we've, so we've got quite a large chapter on this in the book, and there's a, there's too much probably to cover now. But I think yeah. it, it is, I suppose, breaking it down to kind of diet, exercise and other lifestyle things. I mean, there is no menopause diet, but there are certainly dietary patterns that have been shown to be protective in terms of long term health and also may help in terms of symptom control. So having a largely whole food diet, so not minimizing processed foods is really important. Mm -hmm. And having a largely plant based diet is very important, a fiber rich diet, one that's rich in vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, beans, legumes. Um, all the whole grains is really important. So it doesn't mean that people need to necessarily become vegetarian or vegan, but um, in the recent British Menopause Society um, conference, they were talking about this and saying, actually, they're, they're recommending, um, you know, a, a largely plant based diet. So over 80 percent of your diet should be based around that, looking at recent research. And. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. A, a plant-based diet is inherently anti-inflammatory. And if you think some of the symptoms are arising because of an, a rise in, in inflammation in the body, because estrogen is an anti-inflammatory hormone, um, anything you can do um, to kind of reduce that can be beneficial. There's also changes that happen in the gut. So if you have a fibre-rich diet, um, then there's the, um, the, that can be helpful in terms of symptom control. Also can help if there's issues with digestive upsets and stuff like constipation, which can occur um, you know, when, when you've kind of got lower estrogen and things like that. Um, and even there's just the there's 
even changes to do with the enzymes in the in the in the bowel that the bacteria produce. If you have a plant based diet, you tend to have less of an enzyme called beta glucuronidase, which reactivates breakdown products of HRT, for example, and can lead to fluctuations in hormone levels, which again can trigger further further symptoms. So there's a whole number of you know range of reasons why we recommend it, um, and I don't think I've done a particularly good job of summarising the reasons why. But essentially, have a really varied diet and lots of fruits and veggies, basically. Um, and min minimizing processed foods. And Mandy mentioned alcohol. Unfortunately, it isn't your friend. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of menopausal women, whatever their age, will, will testify to that. Yes. And often there's <laughs> an intolerance that happens, partly as, reduced, uh, as a result of reduced enzyme, which um, helps break down the alcohol, but also the body composition tends to change, um, which means that we don't tolerate alcohol as well. But alcohol is known to kind of be an endocrine disruptor, so it does directly affect hormones. And if you're on HRT, it can cause big fluctuations in levels. And often people will know if they have a glass of wine, they may be struck with, you know, severe anxiety or hot flush in the middle of the night um, as their alcohol levels and estrogen levels fall again. It's not to say you can never drink, um, but it's just about being a bit more mindful and sticking ideally to under seven units a week, because we know that up to seven units a week, which is less than a bottle of wine uh, spread over a week, is probably not too detrimental to brain health. Um, but any more than that has been shown to be. Um, so if you do drink, choose good quality, maybe have small amounts with food um, to lessen the effects of alcohol. Um, obviously, smoking is a no-no because that's going to that's a negative on, your, on every part of your body, essentially. But obviously, your, your bone and your heart health particularly. Um, exercise is really important and particularly strength training exercises and weight bearing exercises to protect your bone health and maintain some of your muscle mass because we lose a lot of our muscle mass as we go through menopause as well. Um, and also for those women who can't take HRT, exercise is going to be, again, hugely important. Um, we know with actually particularly with strength training or weightlifting, for example, if you build strength in your muscles, um, that, that, that can actually counter hot flushes and things um, in a way that actually cardiovascular exercise doesn't tend to do. So the running, swimming, cycling, brilliant for your heart and maybe for stress relief and mm -hmm. things like that, but not so, going to be so beneficial for the hot flushes yoga things like that can be really helpful just because it's a whole body exercise but also the whole mindful component it can help calm down the autonomic nervous system reduce stress and and there have been studies showing this can be beneficial for women who's particularly who've been through breast cancer treatment and can't take you know can't take hrt and helpful for sleep and things like that managing stress hugely important but it's hard isn't it because you've been given a diagnosis maybe you didn't expect or maybe you expected it if you've undergone a surgical menopause, but hadn't quite been prepared for it. And it is a huge physical shock for your body to go into. Stress has a direct impact on the way your body deals with hormones, whether they're your own or if it's through HRT and other medications, to be honest, as well. Um, and so kind of really looking after yourself and prioritising yourself is, is important. Um, so things like mindfulness, meditation, but if they're not for you, even just, I don't know, taking up a new hobby, um, connecting with people who enjoy the same things, connecting with people who maybe have the same diagnosis so you don't feel so alone. All of those things are incredibly important. And I mean, there's lots of other things that we could talk about, but I know we don't have much time. But, um... <laughs> yeah, there is only so much time. So you've both sort of you've both touched on the sort of the emotional health and the emotional impact. And obviously, you know, sort of for me, you know, sort of my role in this has been more about emotional support for individuals who are experiencing premature menopause. Um, and, you know, sort of one of the things that always strikes me is that how multifactorial it is, the fact that you have individuals who have been given a diagnosis that puts them into a life stage that perhaps their own mothers haven't reached yet they're having to use medication that they never expected to have to use some of them may have never they might not even be at an age where they might have even considered their fertility or perhaps relationships or perhaps perhaps sexual health etc um, now that is an enormous topic all on its own but are there sort of um, from your work in in this area and having you know sort of lots of patients in this area 
are there sort of any uh, key messages that you would sort of want people to hear around emotional health, around relationships, and particularly around, you know, the potential of fertility? Are there things that, I mean, I know there is lots in the book, but for the purposes of this, are there messages that you would both want to share to people? Mandy, we start with you. Yes, so one of the key messages I think is that that if you are affected, you're not alone. It is more common than you might think. Um, and it might be hard at the beginning to talk about it. And it might be difficult to choose the right person to open up to. And this is often, um, I have met patients where when they open up about it within the family, they the family did not really support them or it wasn't um, a supportive environment for them and they would still face um, being asked at family get-togethers when the grandchild will arrive you know by their own mum so I think it is it is a difficult place to be in when you are 17 or, or 18 or, or, or 25 and and you don't want to be thinking about fertility in particular um, but even if you are child free by choice, so you actually made your peace with not having your own children, it is something that comes up time and time again. And I think it is probably important that um, that you find someone, a support group, an environment where you can be very, very open about your feelings and emotions and where you don't have to justify your choices and decisions. That could be um, a charity like the Daisy Net. It could be a, a local support group that you can start yourself because you will be surprised how many women and girls yes. in the area. Yeah. So sometimes you have to be proactive and look for support and that can require a lot of strength. It could be online, although that is a mixed bag. Uh, sometimes online um, platforms can be quite judgmental or they can also be uh, detrimental as well. But, um, or it could just mean therapy, one-to-one -one investing in therapy or asking the GP to to uh, refer you to to counseling to just um uh, deal with with the repercussion because it is such a multifactorial it affects so many aspects of your life there's the fertility the reproductive side there is the, the physical immediate acute symptoms that you experience and then there's the long-term health consequences so you have three major aspects that are looming over your head and to to make sense of it and to gain a positive positivity uh, from this and realize that you are okay you're complete the way you are you do not have to justify to anyone how you are what you do and be um, and, and not lose your identity over this and not define yourself over this it's, it's very difficult so don't be afraid to look for help uh, in the right places and it's fine to fail it is um, okay to say no and set boundaries to people who you realize are not ready for this because sometimes it is not actually you yourself who struggles it is a part of your family it is your sister is your is your mom you know who, who doesn't understand it and you keep and you, you hit a brick wall every time so um give these people time as well but also allow yourself time to process everything and there is no no time limit how long it will take you it's a process it's a it's a maturity learning curve obviously that is much harder for someone at a much younger age with, with less life experience if you're 50 and you experience menopause you've had a lot more life experience a lot more adversity that you already overcome a lot more success stories you can tell where you have been unwell and you came out of the, at the other end but if you have to deal with such a massive burden when you're younger then it requires growing up quickly basically but you can do it it's um it may it's it's makes you who you are and and there's always hope and i also have met women who okay, who are now um uh, achieved a natural age of menopause who had pri in the past who are now happy living a happy and fulfilled life so having that vision for the future of yourself of what you want to be who you want to be is really important and developing that through therapy um is a good place i think or through support groups Hannah, is there anything that you would add to add to Mandy's thoughts there? Well, I think firstly, just to say, I mean, Mandy's kind of touched on it, you know, we're not defined by our reproductive status, for example. And I think probably women across the world can testify that whether or not they have POI, whether or not they have children. And I think there's maybe some people 
more than others may feel and find it necessary to work through that because their identity as a woman may be tied up with the fact that uh, obviously women have children and if if that is for some women they have a desperate maternal kind of inst you know yearning and and if they're unable to fulfill that naturally they can feel like a failure but i think our society doesn't help that and hopefully the conversations around that are, are changing because we're all so much more than our, our, our reproductive organs or our ability to bear children or not um, I, I just I think it's the challenges that are thrown up with POI. It's, it's obviously around a woman's place in society and how you know a woman feels it by herself. Um, but it's it's also about feeling like you're old before your time. But it doesn't make you old. It's, you are still, as you say, a young woman and with your life ahead of you. This needn't be life limiting. And there are so many options. Um, whether it is about fertility or you know having children in your life if that's important to you, or having a completely different life without children, which may be you know it's something of your choosing. Because again, we don't want to assume everybody wants wants children. Um, and I think the other thing is not to assume um, people's response. So I think people worry, and especially in terms of dating, if you've been quite um, young when you're diagnosed, that nobody's going to want to kind of go out with you because you you, you are very unlikely to be able to carry a baby. But also thinking other other people, and as GPs, we'll have seen this. So many people are you know will have issues in that area or will have problems that they don't want to talk about that are uncomfortable talking about and actually um, most people want to be with you because of who you are yes. <laughs> um, and I and I think it's you know trust well, once you've developed a bond with somebody trust those people don't don't make assumptions um because you hear sad stories unfortunately people saying well thinking they should split up with their partner because they they can't have children or they should you know just they they just shouldn't bother dating because there's no point and I think well there are men out there for example who don't want kids <laughs> or there are men out there who you know can't have children it don't never make this assumption um and people can surprise you so but i think yeah, absolutely is key so yeah absolutely and there are there are really fabulous chapters in the book about uh, about lots of things but particularly um there isn't a huge amount of information about relationships about sexual well-being about fertility and there are really good chapters in the book all about those things um one of the chapters that I really loved in the book um, is right at the end, and it's the chapter about diversity and inclusion. And the reason that I liked it so much is because I spend a lot of time trying to find information, <laughs> factual evidenced information that I can share with people who perhaps are neurodiverse, or uh, to give you an example, um, I've had a couple of women who have contacted menopause support because they have young transge transgender men in their lives and I'm scrabbling around to try and find information. So could you just sort of, could you just give a very, very brief overview? Um, a, why you wanted to, can one of you cover why you wanted to include it and then what you have included and why, why you feel it's so important? Do you want me to do it, Mandy? Or yeah, just, okay. either, either. <laughs> um, I think it is important. Well, obviously, P POI and early menopause, although they're touched upon in, in other, there's lots of other amazing menopause books out there now, they, they're not, they don't really, you know, there hasn't really been a home for them. That's why we wanted to, to do this. Um, but we wanted to recognise the menopause experience can affect anybody and, you know, who's born with ovaries, essentially. And um, not we don't all fit into neat boxes. And I think, you know, both Mandy and, and I, um, you know, we're kind of white middle class women and we a lot, a lot of the patients that we see probably could have come from a similar demographic, probably partly because of where we live in the UK. Um, and I, but recognising that and also even just from my own personal experience, recognising my experience isn't going to be the same as somebody else's experience, even if they've gone through the same like surgical menopause at 35. So we know, for example, there's a difference in the way that um, women, um, you know, black women, for example, and how they access menopause care and how often they're offered HRT and things like that. So, and, and it's like looking at the reasons why that might be. And so I spoke to a black clinician who was able to kind of give, you know, inform us in that area. And she works for a menopause and HIV service. And again, HIV is a really complicated, um, well, it can be a very complicated condition with extra challenges. And there's an association with early menopause. Um, there's, there's, 
there are studies now coming out of HIV and menopause, but again, they're not really, they're in the literature, medical literature, academic literature, but they don't tend to reach much of the mainstream. No. So we wanted to kind of put that in the book and say, this is what we know. And to be honest, on, the, on all of those little sections in the book um, and on the diversity chapter, there's, there's not, we don't know a lot, which is basically, it's just a taster saying, this is what we know so far. For example, we talk about um, the deaf and hard of hearing community and how they don't often have good access um, to, to evidence based um, information, especially for them. English is often a second language and British Sign Language is, is, there, is how they prefer to learn. I know Louise Newson has got some stuff on her website, for example, that's been um, done in sight and sign language, which is great, but there's so much more work that we need to do as a medical community. Then you mentioned the um, young transgender um, males. And if, if you're born with female sex organs and then you go through, um, you know, a transition um, later because of your medical affirming treatment, you'll be placed in, or not always, but often will be placed in a medical menopause to switch off ovarian function um, and may end up having a surgical menopause. But there are vast differences. So it's I think the problem is this isn't dealt well with in the LGBT space either. Um, so transgender health clinics aren't specialists generally in menopause, and yet some of the issues that can arise from the treatment are actually menopausal symptoms, and there is the impact on fertility as well. Um, and it's just important to recognise all of that. I did interview a trans man for the book who, for, for him, it was, a, you know, revelation, you know, going through early menopause was amazing for him because it allowed him to become who he felt he'd always been. Um, and, was and that so, Lee Hurley? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. But, but, and, but you see, for Lee, things like symptoms like vaginal dryness were actually a positive sign because he it didn't feel like he was having you know more female attributes and symptoms so whereas for somebody else obviously that's kind of much you know much more difficult thing to deal with so it's like you have to reframe it and and you know look look at things in a very different way and I've also spoke to Nigat Arif who um, many people will know because she's you know she's a GP she's on the t TV quite a lot she's excellent at kind of summarizing stuff and she does a lot of work in the British and Muslim Pakistani community mm. and there's a lot of there are cultural issues there yes. and um, it's not just in, in in that group as well but other kind of religious groups um, where a woman is is even more so than in the average society as it looked from her reproductive status and sometimes if you are unable to conceive, it's viewed as kind of almost like a curse from God. And it's trying to unpick that. I mean, I know Nigat's doing amazing work in that area. But again, it's not something neither Mandy or I can talk about from personal or professional experience. So it's really important to speak to people um, who, who work in that area and really know what the core issues are. So we weren't trying to say, oh, well, we've got all the answers. We know everything about these things. But we wanted to kind of to say look, that there, there are these groups that are even more marginalized than the POI group and, and they can fall within this, this umbrella as well. Um, and yet in the neurodiversity, that's a whole new thing that's, that we're now linking because there tends to be hormone sensitivity with neurodiverse conditions. So that can make it slightly more difficult, tricky to manage symptoms. Well, yeah. can I just say that I think that that final chapter, I think it's the final chapter, should be an information booklet on its own. <laughs> okay oh, well. <laughs> because I think it is the best bringing together of information that would be really useful for the general public so if I ever persuade a government to do a national campaign around menopause I think that final chapter should be part of it <laughs> um, so I said uh, when we were talking before we uh, came on to record this that I would like to ask you both about a piece of wisdom that you would like to share with listeners, watchers of this, um, of this chat. Um, so Mandy, can I ask you first, um, you know, sort of from the work you've done, from the people that you've worked with, from everything that you've learnt, what would be, you know, kind of what would be a piece of wisdom that you would like to share with individuals who are either experiencing this right now or may go on in the future to be diagnosed? Well, um, as I previously said, you, you know, even though you, you may feel abandoned or alone, you're not, you're not alone. And I would say there's always, always hope. So you may come across a healthcare professional who will see you and say, 
there's nothing else we can do. It is what it is. Just take it and that's it. Then, no, you know, go somewhere else. Do always look for second opinions if you're not happy because there's always hope. Hope is last. That's a Russian thing, I think. Um, but it is, it is like that. You, you don't give up because you may have bad days, but you will always have good days again. And it might be harder for you, but that's your that's your life and it doesn't mean you can't live it to the fullest even with this with this condition as well and this i would even say you can turn this into something positive you can turn this to teach others to gather strength from it and turn it into something amazing um you know so don't give up hope and seek second opinions if you're not happy with the treatment you receive would be my advice okay lovely thank you hannah the same from you a piece of piece of hannah wisdom please <laughs> i would just say that it's important to keep in mind that poi and early menopause doesn't define you doesn't define me it, it's just part of who we are um and as mandy said actually we even from the most difficult experience you tend to gain something even if it's not immediately obvious so i think without my own personal experience i probably well i almost certainly would not be working in this area i wouldn't have met you two i you know i've had some amazing work opportunities as well and i and i hope that the work i do is kind of meaningful it does feel that you can kind of contribute something meaningful but you know and be having the chance to write the book i almost certainly would never have written this book would i've ever written a book you know so i think it, sometimes it takes many years it's now nine years since my surgery to to realize that actually there have been some positive to what's would have for most people seen a very negative situation um and then the other thing is like man says oh you know always have hope there are always options um whether if you can take HRT and it's not suiting you. Um, there are different types of HRT. If you can't take HRT, there are other things you can do. There, and we didn't even have a chance to cover half of these things. But there's, and we've even got another chapter in the book, um, uh, which Ma Mandy Bate was largely responsible for, like menopause head to toe, which is looking at all the other things you can do. You may be on medical treatment, you know, um, either HRT or one of the alternatives, and maybe it's not enough. You may already have addressed dietary and lifestyle factors. What other things can you do? So that just the, the, always that there's always something that, that you can do. Um, and, and I think that's it really. It's kind of being being hopeful and realizing it just that it, it doesn't doesn't define you. It's just one part of who you are. And where would you both where would you both be signposting people to? for you know sort of for help and support for factual evidence-based information apart from your lovely book um <laughs> where would you be signposting people to well to your service menopause support <laughs> <laughs> i was for not one, expecting one. you to say that <laughs> well um i think you you're doing a great service and and you know your, what you do is is great and um um, it is one option, but obviously there are charities like the Daisy Net. Hannah used to um, be in, um, in, in with the Daisy Net. Um, there's the Menno charity as well, um, and the British Menopause Society have uh, very, very good um, information. Yeah, we have a patient arm called the Women's Health Concern, um, and if you um, you might want if you your surgery, you might want to ask if there's a doctor with a special interest in menopause, and there are more and more of them. Yes, uh, you might you have options. So if you have an assigned GP and um, he doesn't or she doesn't know much, that's that's OK. You know, um, you can ask within the surgery, is there someone who has a special interest in menopause or could you refer me? So um, you could look for local support, whether there's a local menopause, a group of women who, who chats and discusses there's online support. Um, although I have to always say be very careful with online support. Uh, do not follow. Uh, advice with regards to medication um, without talking to your doctor as well, because this is not always um, factually correct. Um, yeah, so there's this. Um, yeah, I would um, always uh, look for um, reputable advice that comes from um, big organizations like the British Menopause Society or Women's Health Concern first. Anything to add to that, Hannah? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what Mandy's saying. Like the Daisy Network is obviously the primary place for, for women with, with POI. But again, just going back to the diversity thing, it may not feel the right place for everybody. And there, are, I would I would uh, recommend looking at the Menopause Inclusion Collective. And so they're kind of gathering um, a lot of information and, and you know factual based information support groups. So, for example, there's groups like Black Women in Menopause and information on neurodiversity, um, LGBT and Q issues in menopause, um, and also you know issues to do with economic disadvantage. Because and that's something I didn't mention. We'd also mentioned in the back of the book um, that that's a good place that's a good place to go as, as well um, there are smaller groups like together in surgical menopause set up by um, two lovely women who've also gone through um, surgical menopause at a young age um, and in America there's the Sermeno connection it, again it, it depends I mean again if you've gone through surgical menopause for PMDD there's IAPMD um, so we try to gather these together in the book to put up and we eventually we will also be picking up a list on our websites with further information, but we're still working through that because there's so much we want to include. But um, now yeah. I hesitate to ask you both this because I know how busy you both are. Would you both like to tell us where people can contact you or would you prefer not to? <laughs> <laughs> We both have websites. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> so, Mandy, what's your website? I picked a really long name, hormoneequilibrium.co.uk. Um, I'm based in Hampshire, but I do not take new patients at the moment because I'm very busy with uh, the way I, uh, I work. And um, to provide the best care for my existing patients, I had to, to limit taking on new patients. I also uh, cannot, unfortunately, uh, give you advice by email if you're not my patient. So I'm, I have to make that clear for professional, for my professional point of view. I, I cannot, if I haven't met you, if I don't know you, I cannot give you medical advice. But that's why we wrote the book. Um, yes. Hannah and, and me, we have limits to as to how many patients we both uh, can see uh, in terms of time uh, that we have available. So that's why we signpost women to those who who need you know so the book is a good start I think yeah absolutely and Hannah your website it's just drhannahshort.co.uk um it's a work in progress at the moment and like Mandy my my clinic list is closed currently but hoping to open up some slots probably later in the year early into next year but again it's just a balance when you're a kind of single-handed practitioner yeah um, I mean, I do I do have a Twitter account, but it's obviously I can't give medical advice via Twitter and I do share all kinds of stuff. It's not all menopause related quite frequently. It's not. But occasionally I will share kind of, uh, you know, recent studies or information about early menopause or menopause and cancer and things like that. So, um, yeah. So. And Mandy, you quite often share really good information via your Instagram account, don't yeah, you? I'm, I'm less. So I use Twitter mainly for um, for information myself. So. I follow um, professional uh, accounts that that um, uh, put out the information, but I'm not very active on Twitter. I'm more active on Instagram, which I still don't quite know how it works. But <laughs> yes, <laughs> you're doing fine. <laughs> yes. Um, so yes, so follow me on Instagram on Woman Equilibrium, or if you Google, if you put my name, and you'll find me as well. Um, and I, I'm I, I do share latest studies and information I come across there that is relevant and important for women to know. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So as I said, this is it. Now they're both going to hate me for this, but they have said there are lots of other good menopause books out there. In my opinion, I think this is actually the most rounded. I think this is, mm -hmm. if you're going to buy one, even if POI, premature menopause is not going to affect you, I think this is the best book on menopause out there. Oh, um, wow. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, everything that we've talked about today uh, with these two wonderful women is all part of why I started this, which is the National Make Menopause Matter campaign. For those of you who are not familiar with it, A, why not? <laughs> um, the reason I started it is because it became very clear to me after my own experience, um, similarly to Hannah, mine was a surgical menopause, um, that there was a huge chasm where both um, general information, professional knowledge, support and care 
should exist. And so I started the campaign and we have three clear aims. The first is to have mandatory menopause training for all our GPs and medical students. I'm thrilled to tell you that from the academic year 24-25, all medical students will now do mandatory menopause training along with mandatory training in women's health, which is marvelous. The second is to have awareness and support in every workplace. And that is definitely happening organically. And the third is to have menopause included in the RSE curriculum in schools. And again, I'm delighted to say that in actually in July, 2019, we were advised that that would happen it went onto the curriculum in September 2020, right in the middle of a global pandemic. So not perfect for all those poor teachers out there tasked with teaching it. Um, it will embed eventually into the curriculum. Those teachers need support with resources to teach that. Um, and we very much hope that that will be throughout the UK too. I mean, I would very much like to see that globally. We have just over 180,000 signatures on the campaign to date. So huge thanks to everybody who's already signed it. These two amazing women are currently sporting campaign <laughs> t-shirts. So we will get, there we go. <laughs> so of the three of us, I'm the only one <laughs> who's not, which is very poor. But if you would like to raise your voice and become part of the generation who will make menopause matter, please head to the menopause support website, which is menopausesupport.co.uk and consider not just signing, but also sharing the petition on your socials too and encouraging your connections to raise their voices too. Because it's by grassroots community at all levels coming together that we will make the changes that we need to see. Essentially, it's the only thing that ever has. So thank you again to Mandy and to Hannah for your time. It's really appreciated. Thank you for writing this amazing book. Um, and do either of you have any last words that you would like to share? Just um, thank you really for um, kind of having us on and I think, you know, um, give us the opportunity to talk about the book and why we think it's so important and, and thanks for all the work that you do. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I will share this and I'm sure lots of people will get lots of help from your wisdom. So it's been an absolute pleasure to host you. Thank you both very much.